Yeah. yeah wow like this is this is why i said uh true uh, web3 og uh, you were really there for the beginning um that's that's very exciting um so so what was it like back then like you already um, explained like you could basically read everything there was about the topic because it was so small so did you end up uh, where did you start working what country did you move somewhere did was it london or where, where did you get started so the the office was actually in Berlin. So oh, okay. when you say um, how it was back then, so it was still extremely distributed, which back in those days, remote work was not as common as today, mm -hmm. post-COVID time. It's called a pre-COVID time. So many people, also tech workers, mostly worked in offices, but the Bitcoin world was very spread. Um, there was a very strong ideology, um, which is still there and like this Bitcoin thinking uh, but not in the terms of maximalism you see today it's more of like very um political very like um we are separating money from the state it's about independency it's about self-serenity this was what it was all about but also technically um back then the th thinking was well all the other like other altcoins or alternative chains would build things and bitcoin would just adopt the best of it so back then people still thought bitcoin would quickly adopting and like oh, okay. introducing new technologies but then we had this debate about the block size like the one megabyte or not and you saw quickly bitcoin was not able to evolve um, technically it was more a currency which needed a blockchain to exist but a blockchain was not the focus it was the currency which was the focus and there was all those out of chains coming up this one app chains like prime coin where the sort of full fork you would mine prime numbers or there were many other alternatives or Litecoin or Namecoin. Namecoin was just simple. Actually, the similar thinking as ENS, like getting a name, but having its own chain for this application. So Vitalik thought us that, well, if we can build a virtual machine where you can do all those things freely, like in smart contracts, having a programmable part in the blockchain, you can solve all of those issues with one, with one platform, one blockchain for all of them. He tried with Bitcoin first, but he didn't, succeed and like convincing them to making such a major change so then he went to the mastercoin guys back then and he did they thought it was too aggressive too much change he wanted to put to their chain which had for each um application they needed a protocol change more or less so and then he said well screw it i stopped my own and then Vitaly came uh, gavin gavin came as the one who was able to implement it so sometimes underestimated how big the influence or role of Gavin Wood was in Ethereum. I know he's doing Polkadot today, a little bit different ecosystem, but he was able to execute Vitalik's mm -hmm. vision and write a technical paper called the Yellow Paper. Um, and this was very exciting times. So we were very tech focused, where we build it and they will come. And so this was yeah, not just exciting, also the mindset was everything can happen. This was like on this platform, anything can be built. And it's still a niche group. So we were at the beginning 20, 30 people on Ethereum. Um, then DEF CON Zero in Berlin, this was in 2015. I think it was about 40, 50 people there. Um, so very small group in Kreuzberg and it was fun. And uh, we, we shared, we all, almost exclusively talked about the tech. And price was like a hidden rule. You don't speak about the price. Back then, the price was not really live. So the, the, the Ethereum hasn't launched. But also afterwards, price was really not the motivation for most of the people there. Um, it was this, this freedom, this enablement, this ownership as possible and fighting against the big tech and governments. This was more the mindset. Not, maybe it's too strong. Maybe they, they, the group was very diverse. Maybe not anybody not thought like that, but many had this mindset of creating something so independent and strong that would not rely on any government or t a big tech company and would easily outlive them eventually. So this is a thinking coming from Bitcoin. You create something which exists forever. And this was the spirit. In, and actually the term Web3, there is an earlier version about um, more the, a different semantic web, but Gavin Wood wrote a blog post in summer 2014. And that's where he defined Web3 for me. That's what brought me into Ethereum. And this was this post Edward Snowden time, and we need to like reinvent the web, stop giving data to these big companies, having more control. And Ethereum was not just building a blockchain and initially thought about building a platform for decentralized application. And part of this would be the Ethereum chain. Part of this would be Swarm, a decentralized file storage, and Whisper, decentralized messaging. 
The other two didn't take off as Ethereum did, and like other protocols kind of replacing it, similar to like IPFS and Filecoin for file storage and other alternatives. So, but the thought was let's build an infrastructure for decentralized applications and making sure there's never ever a single point of failure. It's always completely non custodial. And if you build an application, you actually just build something which is not relying on you, even the Front end can be hosted somewhere else. Smart contracts live forever on chain. That's how those applications should be. That's why we call them dApps for decentralized applications. And there was even a joke or like a sticker that my app is app coin free, meaning don't create your own token. So it's like we, you, we all use Ether. So this was the mindset in 2014, 15, 16. Of course, then the DAO happened, uh, which was amazing in some sense. Of course, it was extreme and it was um I wouldn't say set us back. It, fo it we focused on security and smart contract security and those things. Then the ICO phase came, DeFi, NFTs. And I mean, the, yeah, we don't want to get into all the details, but it was a very exciting time. And now I think if you compare it to today, there are a lot of applications which use a little bit of blockchain by using maybe some coins, using maybe some NFTs or using this and that. But this mindset of creating applications which last forever, which are independent of any company, which just... Like similar to Uniswap or ENS, you can build your own user interface. You can just use those smart contracts. You're not relying on any company behind it to run. This was what we thought would happen with Ethereum.